Audu billahi minel şeytanir rejim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Şahinuhu ve nestağfiruh. Ve na'udu billahi min şerari enfüsüne. Ma yahdihi la fela mudilla ve ma yudrilu fela adiyya. Ve eşhedü en la ilahe illallah vahdehu la şerike le. Ve eşhedü en Muhammeden abduhu ve resuluhu sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem. Eşhedü en la ilahe illallah vahdehu la şerike le. Ve eşhedü en Man yuti'la ve rasulahu fakad raşada ve man yasihime fe inna la yadurru illa nafsahu ve la yadurru laha şey'an amma ba'd. Fe kâle lahu da'ala fil Kur'an'il karim fis suratu bakara bismillah. Mataluhum ka matalillezî istavâ qadnâren fellemmâ edâet mâ havlâhû lezâbelâhû bi nûrihîm ve tarakâhûn fî zulmâtin lâ yufsirûn summun bukmun umyan fahûm lâ yârcîûn ve sadakallâhu'l-azîm Barakallahu li ve lakum fil Kur'an'il karim ve nefa'ani ve yâkum bil zikril hakim innehu huvete vâdi râuf rahim El-an hayyet tâyyü Asim refuge in Allah from Satan, from Shaitan, the accursed devil in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, all praise is due to Allah all gratitude is due to Allah I seek his help and beg his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the mischief and the evils of our souls. Whosoever Allah guides, there is none who can lead that person astray and whomsoever Allah finds in error, there is none to guide them. I bear witness there is no God, no deity existing and therefore worthy of worship except Almighty Allah. Glory be to him who is one alone unique without partner or associate. And I bear witness further that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him as Allah's servant, messenger, and apostle. And he, Allah, has sent his messenger in truth and with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and also as a warner, a prophetic warner in advance of the hour of judgment. Therefore, whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger, surely that person is rightly guided, and whomsoever disobeys the two of them, surely that person harms only his or her own soul, and they harm not Allah the slightest little bit, the least little bit, as for what follows. For Allah, glory be to him, as said in the Quran, in the second surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, the cow, 17th ayah or verse, their example is that of a man who kindled the fire when it illuminated all around him. Allah took away their light and left them in utter darkness so they could see nothing deaf, dumb, and blind, they will never return to the right way. And surely Allah, Tabaraka wa ta'ala, glorified and exalted be he, has spoken the truth. O you who worship Allah, when Allah <coughs> wants to teach us in the Quran, he uses different ways of doing so. And one of the methods that Allah uses to instruct man, to instruct mortal man, to instruct the human being is that of the parable. And so we hear from the verse 
that I've just read from the Quran, the parable, the uh, not even a parable, it's more of a, uh, a simile, wherein Allah speaks of a man who lights a fire, and then when everything around that man becomes illuminated as a result of the fire, Allah takes away the light and leaves them in utter darkness so they could see nothing. And Allah describes them as deaf, dumb, and blind. Oh, you will believe, know that Allah's description of deaf, dumb, and blind, this is not a physical description. This is not Allah describing the human being in physical terms, rather he uses physical conditions that the human being encounters during the life of this world in order to point to a spiritual condition. And so the deafness in the physical world, deafness is an inability to hear. In the spiritual world, deafness is an inability to hear prophetically, an inability to hear the eternal message being spoken by the prophets. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all. It is the, uh, a deafness to the profound lessons and even a deafness to the inner voice through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala glorified and exalted be he speaks to the consciousness of the human being. And one of the conditions of man is the condition of blindness. Blindness is an inability to see in the physical world. But the blindness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking of here is a, the blindness of an inability to see spiritually. The blindness of an inability to see the signs of Allah. And when Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala speaks of dumbness, this is not a a um, statement on intelligence. And be, this could also be translated muteness, an inability to speak, an inability to hear, an inability to see, and an inability to speak spiritually, an inability to speak the truth, an inability to speak that which is reflective of the reality of the world of the spirit. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this method and this language in his book, it is for us, it is for you and I to stop and pause and reflect and to ask ourselves, what is Allah teaching here? What is the sign? What is it that we're supposed to grasp? Or what is it that we are supposed to understand? And so I have chosen today to uh, continue in the direction that I have been speaking for the past several weeks now. And the direction that I speak of is that that seeks to illuminate, that seeks to enlighten our minds as to our wretched condition as a people in America and what we must do in order to overturn or overcome or move past that condition of wretchedness. For know 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've heard me say before, that Allah did not guide you and I as individuals from darkness to light in order that we might continue in our personal lives to move around as if we can't see. If you've been doing bad, Allah didn't guide you to uh, enlightenment in order for you to continue doing bad. If you're one of those people who has been deaf and blind to the lessons of life, and as the result of your deafness and your blindness to the lessons of life, could uh, 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 function or live in a wretched condition, know that Allah did not guide you from darkness to light for you to continue stumbling around in life, for you to continue bumping your head up against the same situations and, and the same um, uh, wretchedness of human condition. However, what I want to remind us of is that uh, this applies not only to individuals, it applies to us as a people. This applies to us as a people. So when you continue to look at the wretched condition of our people, and when I say wretched condition, again, don't free your mind from this reflecting on things based on a physical example. When I say wretched condition, I'm not talking about, although I could be, a wretched condition of health. I, I'm not talking about a wretched condition as far as the poverty index is concerned, although I could. I'm speaking of a wretched psychological and spiritual condition. And Allah has not guided us as a people to al-Islam in order for us to continue to live in a wretched manner, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. O oh, you who worship Allah, for weeks now, for weeks now, I have labored trying to shed some degree of light on the fact that the um, prophetic significance of the passage of 400 prophetic years of the sojourn of you and I in America, let me be very specific, because we have people of different ethnic groups here, so you need to make sure you understand what I'm saying. This, uh, the significance of the passage of 400 years in the West of people of African descent has not been lost on enlightened people in the society. For the, and, and you may or may not be aware that for the past year, all throughout the country, that people who are, who are enlightened as to the plight and the condition and the wretchedness of African people in the West, and the plight and the wretchedness of how African people got to be in the West, and the plight and the wretchedness of what lies before us, not living the American dream, but experiencing, as Al Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, Rahmatullah Ali, as he used to say, experiencing the reality of the American nightmare. A friend of mine said, if you're tired of hearing, about the plight and the struggle of these people in the West, black people. If you're tired of hearing about it, then imagine how we feel living it. <clears> or <throat> oh, you who believe. I've labored for weeks now trying to pose, 
to our collective consciousness. I'm not talking just on an individual basis here. I have a responsibility as the Khatib, uh, as the person who delivers the khutbah on Fridays to speak to the community, to speak to the congregation, to speak to you uh, 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 collectively about that which is in our collective interest and that which is a collective concern for us. <laughs> and so I posed the question, I think it was two weeks ago, how will we thrive at this point in history? Not how will we survive. We know how we've been surviving as a people in America. But how will we thrive? How will we progress? How will we, be, will we uh, move forward as a people in America at this place and at this time all around us, other people? People who came to the West under completely different circumstances than we came. People who came to the West uh, voluntarily, not involuntarily. Or those who are the sons and daughters of those who came, uh, who, who, who came uh, voluntarily and not involuntary. Those who did not have the option to come through Ellis Island or JFK Airport and when they give you that form, they didn't have the option to check white, although their skin is black in their mind. I hope you know there are people who do that. I hope you know that, that the uh, skin color game is an important aspect of the census that's taken every few years in this country. And that's why, uh, uh, even now, you may or may not be aware that since the last sentence, uh, census, excuse me, there have been behind closed door battles regarding the terminology and the wording on the census forms so as to give or deprive, listen to what I'm saying, so as to give or deprive an advantage of some people over another people. And some of you, I see you, you nodding here, so you, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, you who worship Allah. Our, how will we thrive? Don't sit in front of the door, brother, that's a fire in there. How will we thrive as a, a people? <clears throat> and further, last week, I posed the question to us uh, based on Tafsir of Surato Yusuf. <coughs> tafsir of Surato Yusuf that was related to the question of thriving. How was a Nebi Yusuf, the Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, able to thrive? in spite of his wretched condition as an individual, in spite of being kidnapped as a child, betrayed, sold into slavery, uh, forcibly transplanted from the land of his birth to a land in which he was a stranger, in spite of that, in spite of the fact that uh, Nebuchadnezzar Yusuf, uh, uh, peace be upon him, the prophet Joseph found himself after being initially traumatized as a child, found himself re-traumatized as an adult by being thrown into a prison, thrown into a dungeon because of no wrongdoing whatsoever on his part. How did he uh, uh, thrive? Not just how did he survive. How did he thrive as an individual? He thrived as an individual through faith. He thrived as an individual through cultivating a personal relationship with Allah. And he strived as an individual. He thrived as an individual by persevering. 
O you who believe. And so Allah has given us the example, the example in the Quran that we might reflect upon this as a people and learn the lesson from the individual example of a Nebi Yusuf salam, and apply it to ourselves conscientiously as a people. So a Nebi Yusuf salam, thrived in spite of his wretched condition as an individual through faith. And we have survived to this point as a people through faith. However, going forward, um, <coughs> transcending our wretched condition, I said that there comes a time in the life of every traumatized, abused person or people, every traumatized people who experiences catastrophes and devastation. There comes a time in the life of every people, regardless of whether the source of their catastrophe or their devastation is the so-called act of God, floods, earthquakes, extensive fires, etc. Or their catastrophe and devastation is the result of acts of man, dropping of atomic bombs genocide, enslavement, etc. There comes a time in the communal life of every people when they must resolve to move beyond whatever has happened to them and to build or to rebuild in spite of their past wretched condition. Oh, you who believe. And we are at that point now. We are at that point as a people. We are at that point where we must try make up our minds as believers. We must make up our minds as Muslims that we are going to push ahead and with the help of Allah through faith and through perseverance transcend the past. Now you might say, well, yeah, alhamdulillah, Imam, but I'm, I'm with you on that, we with that. But that's easier said than done. Because all around us, we see our people going back in the other direction. We see our people being engulfed by habits and by um, uh, brainwashing that subjects them to self-destructive behavior, and this is what you see. You see our people engaged in behaviors that once upon a time they never engaged in as people. Once upon a time they used to say, no, man, we, we don't do that. Somebody else might do that, but, but, but we don't do that. No, man, <laughs> certain type of sexual behaviors, no, man, we, we don't do that, man. That's, that's for somebody else. Uh, uh, extensive suicide. Now, we might have been engaging in extensive homicide, but extensive suicide? No, man, we, 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 we don't do that, man. No, man, I, 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 that, that's not what we do. Now, the behaviors that we avoided in the past, you now see our people, this younger generation, embracing those behaviors and so the consciousness of our people in, in critical areas is receding, receding backwards. But Allah did not call you and I to Islam for us to receive. Allah did not call you and I to move toward the light in order for us to then turn around <laughs> and recede backwards into darkness with a Muslim name. Oh, you who believe, think about this. Think about this because I say again, we are in a terrible condition. 
We are in a terrible condition as a people as the result of the induced trauma that was imposed upon us as a people during slavery. The trauma, uh, uh, and you hear people, people writing books, they writing books, you know, chains and images of psychological slavery, post-traumatic slave syndrome and books like that. You know about those books. If you don't, you need to. And even some of them may say, well, yeah, but that's y'all. That ain't me. I'm not an African American. I, I don't, you know, I, I sympathize with y'all, but uh, 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 that's not me. <laughs> you don't know where you are. You don't know where you are because the African Americans are the canary in the minds of America. You familiar with that phrase? Back in the old days before they had the technology of sophisticated sensors, people that would dig into the earth for a living and go into mines looking for natural gas and things of that nature, they had to come up with a way to detect the fumes of natural gas before they personally would be overcome by them. So in the old world, in centuries past, they discovered that small birds, like a canary, you know, small birds were particularly susceptible to the fumes of natural gas. And so they would put a small bird in a cage and when they would venture into these caves, they would be keeping an eye on the bird. And if the bird collapsed, then they would know that there was natural gas and that they as people had to, had to fall back, fall back, go get the gas mask. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you get this phrase, canary in the mines. Well, Americans of African descent are the canary in the mines of America when it comes to human rights. And when it comes to civil rights. That's why it is our struggles, our struggles that's opened the door for everybody else to come here. You're not African American? Fine. What country do your parents come from? And how did they get here? I guarantee you, I guarantee you that they got here as a result of the changing of the immigration laws in America, you know, unless you're of European descent. Now, if you're white, I ain't talking to you. I got a separate clip box for you. <laughs> you know, but you brown and black people sitting up in here from Africa, you brown and black people sitting up in here from Asia somewhere, you brown and black people sitting up in here from the middle, uh, so-called Middle East, we prefer to call it the Holy Land. The only reason you're here is because of the activity of the canary in the mines. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who said, no, man, we're all human beings. I take what it says in the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, seriously. I'm going to hold you to it. I'm not going to let you say all men are created equal and then you treat me as less than equal. I'm not letting you get away with that. And I'm going to protest. I'm going to lay in, I'm going to fight, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to, I'm going to battle you in the courtrooms, I'm going to do whatever I can do to make you live up to the word of what you put on paper. And everybody else benefits from that. Everybody else in America experiencing freedom except for the people who started the fight in the first place. And these are things that we must be aware of because the Muslims have always been in the fray. When the uh, uh, forced population trans, uh, uh, transfer of slavery occurred centuries ago and millions of people were ripped from their environment and brought to the West by force, there were many Muslims amongst them. And the people who were victimized by that activity, they would fight. And there were many Muslims amongst them fighting. 
And as they move from the old world into the present world, the world of civil rights, the world of human rights, there were many Muslims amongst those fighting and resisting in all of those different ways. And we reap the benefits now of their struggle. So as I said to you a few weeks ago, so when you come to the, listen to a khutbah, and you all know this because most of you come on a regular basis, you come and you hear the imam, um, me, making reference to specific instances and situations from the black American experience. Don't get offended. If you don't go somewhere, if you don't go to a masjid, where the majority of the people going there are Pakistani, and and get a, and get offended when the Imam talks about Kashmir, or the Imam talks about Rohingya Muslims, or the Imam talks about uh, the Uyghur Muslims in China, or the Imam talks about you know Palestinian Muslims in the Holy Land. If you don't get offended by that, don't get offended coming here. Because what I'm doing is I'm using a specific reference to make universal points. I know you're used to people uh, 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 using or uh, 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 utilizing universal references to make particular points, and that's we do that too. But uh, I trust, I trust that you're sophisticated enough, regardless of where you come from or where your parents come from to say, oh, hmm, mom is making a particular reference, but this has a universal application, oh, you who worship Allah. So when I pose the question of uh, how do we thrive through faith, through uh, 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 perseverance, and I forgot to mention also through knowledge, through knowledge, through a conscientious <coughs> reversal of what has been done to us based on knowledge. We must, in the case of a Nebi Yusuf, ultimately the knowledge that sustained him was a prophetic knowledge. The knowledge that he had had this vision as a child, ah, is this part of is this part of what what I envisioned, but didn't really understand. Now, of course, when he reached a certain point of maturity, wherein his brothers and his father came to Egypt and bowed before him, then he understood that the prophecy that he had as a child had come true. That was, that's a different type of knowledge. It's a knowledge of prophetic certainty. And these are the elements, these are the elements that we must utilize as a people if we're going to thrive beyond this point. If we're going to thrive, not just survive. Aren't you tired of surviving? Don't you have a period in your life as an individual man or an individual woman where you're tired of just making it from one day to the other? you tired of just surviving, you want to thrive. Well, if you're gonna move from surviving to thriving, that can only happen through conscientious thinking and deliberate actions. So just as the Nabi Yusuf salam, thrived to, through faith, we must thrive through faith. We've been surviving through faith up until this time now we must become conscientious in our communal practice of faith. And we are Muslim. You have to conscientiously make up your mind to get to the masjid, any masjid, every day and pray in congregation. You can't come to the masjid once a week and, and, and pray in congregation. If you're a Muslim man, you should be at the masjid every single day, more than once a day, and engage conscientiously in communal, religious, and spiritual practice, just as our fasting during the month of Ramadan is communal. You can't just pray, you know, fast Ramadan whenever you want. There's a specific time for it. 
and we all do it together. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated that we must pray together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated that we must, can I use the Christian term, tithe together. That we must, you know, give zakah and sadaqah as a community. As a community, meaning everybody does it, who has the capability according to his or her uh, means. Hajj is a communal activity, a communal obligation. And again, you can't just do it any old kind of way, the way that you want to do it. There's a certain time and everybody functions within that time. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you from the depths of darkness, as he says, to the light and your, your, your enlightened heart gives commands to your enlightened tongue and the result is Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad wa rasulullah I bear witness there is no God worthy of worship and Muhammad is his messenger that uh, enlightened expression must be made in front of other people somebody else has to be your witness has to be your witness as to what Allah has put in your individual heart, or you who believe. And just as a Nabi Yusuf salam, persevered, you and I, we must continue to persevere consciously. And man, don't you know that that's hard? It's hard to hold on to your sanity surrounded by insane people. It's hard to walk with conscientious vision in the valley of the blind. So let me give you an example of our wretchedness. Let me show, show you how wretched we are uh, and the, the type of traps, sociological and psychological traps that we've been placed in uh, uh, as a people. As a people, we are the uh, only people who hold communal, and I'll extend that to say family, celebrations on a day that commemorates our wretchedness. Mm. Mm. I'm talking about, about so-called Thanksgiving. You know, I talk to people, I say, man, what, uh, what, what, what are you celebrating? Well, you know, that's a day when we get together. Oh, yeah? Do Native Americans get together on, on that day and have festive activity? Do the Japanese get together on the day Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs were dropped and have festive activity at home or in the community? Do the Palestinians get together and have festive activity on the day when the... Uh, What's the name of that? The Balfour uh, Declaration went into a, effect, and the secular state of Israel was established on their land. On their land, answers all of the above. No. Yet here we are, and then and then many of us as a people. I'm talking about these people of African descent in the West, Muslims amongst them, Muslims amongst them. Yet here we are in a trap. And in some cases, it's a, what they call a double whammy. Double whammy. Uh, last night, we had a little gathering here at the Masjid. Several brothers and sisters came. You know what I mean? We're, we're celebrating the, the, the relationship, the 500-year relationship of our Muslim ancestors from Africa with Native Americans, and we are affirming our communal ties with the Native American community. So I was very surprised, you know, at one point we were just talking, those of us who had gathered, and if there were 20 of us present, you know, I asked the question, how many of you have in your family um, evidence or even family stories of cross-linkage 
between your African ancestry and your Native American ancestry? I asked the question. So if there were 20 people here, 17 out of the 20 said, well, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, in my family we have Cherokee, or in my family we have Blackfoot, or this, that, and the other. And, and which the high percentage of it surprised me. I really shouldn't have been surprised because they're the ones who felt compelled to come out. But then I want you to think about this. Remember this going forward. We said <coughs> this year marks 400 prophetic years since 20 captive Africans were brought to Jamestown, uh, Virginia, and then enslaved. We, that's when we say that. That's the history, right? So I got news that, because that was in 1619. 1619 to 2019, 400 years. So the first so-called Thanksgiving was in 1621, two years later. So what does that mean? So that means that two years from now will mark 400 prophetic years for Native Americans. And I, and I want you to remember that and watch going forward. Well, they've already made their move. They say, okay, everybody else is doing Thanksgiving. No, we do Day of Mourning. They've been doing that since the 1970s. Native Americans say, no, it's a day of Thanksgiving for you. It's a day of mourning for me, and, and we're going to mourn this day. Who do you think the orange man, 45, who do you think he was shooting side references at a few days ago when he said to his, his crowd of supporters, yeah, you know, there's some people that ain't declared a war on Thanksgiving, he said. Yeah, did you see that on the news? He said, some people have declared a war on Thanksgiving, they want to do it, uh, 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 give it a different name. He said, see, a lot of you don't know that, I can tell by the blank looks on your faces. And I understand because when, when news about him come up, you turn the channel. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and you ain't missing much. I mean, really. You know, you know, but he said that. He had a big rally. And he said, yeah, they want to push back against Thanksgiving, but we know it's Thanksgiving for us, and we're going to hold on to it. This is the same mentality that wants to name baseball, uh, baseball teams with Native American names and have the little caricature. And, and then we, as black people in America, we, look at, we get offended when somebody pokes fun at us. We get offended by Sambo, we get offended by, by Aunt Jemima, uh, you know, and all of that, but then we don't get offended when we see these Native American caricatures. And then, uh, especially when there's somebody in our family, if we would, could get that result in the DNS, DNA test. So I'm citing that as an example. This is a trap where we're in a psychological trap. And, and then, when you make up your mind, no, I'm enlightened, and you try to provide enlightened leadership for your family from all of the different traps that we've been put in, then, here, then here's another trap. You're outnumbered. And so you're put in a position where you have to um, uh, strive culturally, psychologically, spiritually, like a salmon swimming upstream. You know, most fish, Allah says, the, the, uh, I've created signs in the heavens and the earth that you might reflect. So if you study nature, most fish, when they're going to you know, spawn and reproduce, they swim downstream to some spawning waters where the females lay the eggs, you know, and then the males come and they fertilize the eggs and then collectively, collectively their species is reproduced and thrives and moves on to the future. Not salmon. Not salmon. When, when those male salmon want to uh, fertilize those female eggs, they swim upstream fighting, struggling, battling, until they get to, uh, to the top of the stream, and then they go to the spawning waters, 
they fertilize the eggs and then they die. And they die because of the stress and the effects of all that battering and buffeting on their bodies swimming upstream. Maybe someone would say to the salmon, well, why y'all swim upstream, man? Why don't you just turn around and go with the flow? Why don't you? And, and, and he'd have to say to them, man, because my destiny is not at the bottom of the stream. My destiny is at the top. So this is a situation that you and I are in. I know people are woke. You ask people, why do you behave that way? Is it because you don't know better? No, they know better. Just less stressful. Less stressful to go with the flow. Less stre stressful to go along to get along. But I say to you that Allah has not called you and I to the light of Al-Islam in order for us to go along and get along. But rather, he has called us to the difficulty, to the difficulty of striving feats of being law of striving in the cause of Allah that we might experience <coughs> Jannah in the hereafter. For as the Messenger of Allah said in, in an authenticated hadith, he said, paradise will be surrounded by struggle and turmoil and difficulty. And the hellfire will be surrounded by ease and a lack of strife and difficulty, and most people will end up in the hellfire. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdi. Ashadu la ilaha illallah, astaghfiru ka wa atubu alayhi. Ameen. Audhu billahi bin al shaytan al rajim. Bismillahi wa rahman wa rahim. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم بارك وسلم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد عليه السلام والسلام وعلى آله وصحبه وصاره أجمعين برحمتك يا أحم الرحمين وبعد وقال الله تعالى في السورة ماعون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أرأيت الذي يكذب بدي فذلك الذي يدعو اليتيم ولا يحد على تآم المسكي فويل للمصلين الذين هم من سلاتهم ساهم الذين هم يراؤون ويمنعون الماعون وصدق الله العظيم اللهم اكفر لنا مسلمين ومسلمات ومؤمنين ومؤمنات ومحسنين ومحسنات وبعد For Allah has said in the name of Allah the compassionate the merciful God Have you seen the one who denies the day of judgment? He it is who drives away the orphan with harshness and does not encourage the feeding of the poor. So woe to those who offer salah but are ne who offer salah but are neglectful of their salah. Those who make a show of piety but refuse to offer help to the needy. Oh, you worship Allah. This is where we're going to end. We're going to end because what Allah, Allah makes a very profound statement here about shows of piety, you know, doing things to be seen of men. We must make sure that our practice of Islam is not just an outward show of piety. We must make sure that our practice of Islam is rooted in a sincere desire on our part to thrive spiritually as individuals and to thrive spiritually as a collective, as a, a, a people. You know, um, you study uh, the uh, authentic ahadith pertaining to the Eid, celebration of the Eid. The Eid is a collective uh, endeavor. Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, 
in addition to the Eid being a time of prayer, so the Prophet would remind the Muslims that Allah says, wear your beautiful clothing to every time and place of prayer. It's right in the, in the Quran. That's uh, you know, those of you who come to Salat al Juma, you know, dressed like you uh, going to Madison Square Garden as soon as Juma is over. No, you're supposed to put on your beautiful clothes. Somebody says, it's winter, I don't want to get, put on some beautiful winter clothes. <laughs> or some beautiful summer clothes, you know. But you're not supposed to put on your ordinary daily clothing to come to worship, brothers. To come to worship on Yom Juma, which is a special day of the week. That's the first thing. Then here's the second thing pertaining to the E. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the collective, he said, when you go to the Eid on one road, that is to say, when you go to the Eid uh, from one direction, he said, when you leave, take a different road. Take a different path. Leave by a different direction. Why? Why, why did he say that? It was an instruction to the community for us to give da'wah, to give a call to Islam through our collective presence. So if you come one way, he said, leave a different way. Why? So you could be seen. <clears throat> but that's different uh, than, than uh, you know, individual shows of piety. <laughs> oh, look at me. I'm Muslim. Look at me. I smell like a Muslim. Look at me. I got a Muslim name. Look at me. I know how to say salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi Listen, you live in New York City, man. Everybody know how to say that, man. <laughs> God, that's, that's a watchword now. That's an opening for, hey, can you let me have two dollars? <laughs> so I don't live right my two life, you're a uh, Ock, can you let me have two dollars? Uh, you know, so they, they learn how to, no, it's not that. This is our expression of a desire for peace, safety, and security for another believer. That's, that's what Salaam is. It's also our way of saying, hey, uh, you know, I see you. I recognize you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, motivate us and inspire us and enlighten us. We don't want to be like the people Allah mentioned, they light a fire and everything is all bright around. Oh yeah, I see it. I see what needs to be done. I see what our destiny is. I see, yeah, alhamdulillah, and then we don't do anything. We don't do anything. We just keep going along and getting along. We just keep doing this same old thing. Engaged in the same behavior, same way of thinking, same way of everything. And then so that Allah ends up snatching the light and we're plunged in utter darkness. Here's my parting question. So as we've been going over these prophecies and we've noted that the, the, prophet, the promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made to a Nebi Ibrahim, other Islam, said after your, 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 your descendants will be as, uh, enslaved in a land that is not their own and they, they will be in that wretched condition for 400 years, the prophetic uh, promise says, but that's not the end of the promise. It ends by Allah promising a Nebi Ibrahim and after the passage of those 400 years, they will be taken out of their condition and move forward with great prosperity. That's the point. That's the point of the prophecy. And the point of why people like me has constantly been trying to hammer this this uh, message home, it's not just so that we can say woe is me as a people or look what was done to us as a people. It is for us to then uh, to know that there is a promise, there is a destiny waiting for us, but we must engage in the actions that help to bring about the promise of Allah to us just as every other people has done for themselves. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdi. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Ameen wa alqa ikama.